Okay, so good morning or good afternoon. Um, today we'll be covering end-to-end -end target discovery with China-wide association studies and China-wide association studies. So my name is Anastasia Sedlakova. I'm a principal scientist at Community Engagement Group at DNA Nexus, focused on UK BRAP. And here you can see what the agenda we have. So our agenda is pretty packed. Uh, but uh, as Brenton mentioned, you will have the slides after present after webinar, so you can review it. And also, this presentation comes with a code that is already available on our GitHub repository that I will mention in a few slides later. So here you will see the flow chart of what we will cover today. We'll start with creating cohorts. So we'll create uh, cases and controls cohorts, and then we will extract a phenotype, phenotype data as a table, and we will be doing some cleaning of the phenotype data. Then we will be using array data, because array data are mapped to the not latest uh, reference genome. We need to leave them over. And then we're also doing quality control of them. And the second type of genomic data that we'll be using is genomics of England imputed data. The data was uh, um, recently released. It was uh, um, the end of 2022. And here we'll be using this imputed data, but you can use either top mat imputed data, original imputed data, whole exome sequencing, or um, soon there will be release uh, there will be release of whole genome sequencing to 100k pgen files, and all of these different data sources you can use as a second genomic uh, data for this type of analysis. So in our case, we'll be using impute data, and we'll also do um, cleaning of that. So once we have all of our three, uh, three type of data cleaned, we'll be doing GVAS. In this tutorial, we'll be doing GVAS using Regini package. Um, so um, when we when Brenton was doing polls, I saw that a lot of you are using all of the GVAS results, but here we'll be aggregating our results and we'll be selecting the most informative uh, ones by using linguage disequilibrium clumping. So once we um, selected the most informative, we'll be then running FIVAS for each of that variant and aggregating the uh, results. So we need to use our fin and white association studies in this case to see whether variants that are found in our genome white association studies also associate with other phenotypes, not the phenotype of our interest, which could help us to repurpose our target uh, for the therapy, for example. So uh, during this webinar, we'll be going box by box, and we'll be moving to our final destination of phenom-wide association studies. If you are uh, watching our webinars, you may see this slide before. This slide is a little bit simplified, because here I will show you the tools that we will be working with today. So first, we'll start with Cohort Browser. And Cohort Browser is our tool that helps you intuitively learn um, data on our platform. And we'll be using Cohort Browser to create cohorts. We'll be also using some of our tools, mainly two tools, Swiss Army Knife to perform array data quality control, and Regini app, which is a newly released app. It's a wrapped uh, Regini. We'll be also using some um, uh, uh, WDL um, pipelines, and for that, we'll be using DX compiler. And several times, we'll be uh, running code as a Jupyter notebook, and for that, we'll be using single node Jupyter lab. So uh, here is just TLDR, so you know and you can prepare it, um, what we'll be going through. Um, so you will see that uh, researchers uh, can use UKBRAP for their end-to-end -end genomic analysis. And this is actually the purpose of today's webinar, to show you that you can do whole analysis on our platform. You can uh, uh, do cohort selection in Cohort Browser. Then you can uh, use your custom code to do sample QC according to your criteria in JupyterLab. You can do array liftover using WDL script and upload it to our platform. You can also use um, uh, 
uh, Swiss Army knife and mainly plink inside Swiss Army knife to do variant accuracy, or you can parallelize it again using WDL scripts and customize them. Um, we'll be uh, doing uh, genome-wide association studies using Regini app. Then we'll aggregate our data using custom code and we'll be running Plink inside the Jupyter uh, notebook. And we uh, do the final step, phenome-wide association studies by using FIVAS R package inside the Jupyter lab. And as I announced, code is available on our GitHub. So I really recommend you to watch our um, repository because we are putting all of the uh, useful uh, materials for community or materials for webinars there. And this uh, material for this um, webinar will be in the um, folder end-to-end -end GVAS and FIVAS. And uh, as I'm uh, as it's written here, um, my, col my, my colleague Andre Klemper was working on some modifications if you have image-derived phenotype. So watch for that, and this notebook will be released soon. So let's start with our first uh, step, with creating cohorts. Why do we need this step? Is that because in genome-wide association studies and in phenome-wide association studies, we'll be comparing to two different groups. In our case, it will be cases and controls, and in our case, the phenotype definition will be quite easy, but it could be very complex. And also, you need to create cohorts to check that you have adequate numbers of samples. Because if you have a too low number of samples, you may need to redefine your phenotype definition to create larger cohorts. So for this um, uh, example, we decided to select ischemic heart disease which is a narrowing of the artery, which is bringing oxygen to heart, and it's a leading cause of death both in men and women. Um, so how will we do that? We will uh, make phenotype definition, and then after we'll create um, um, cohorts in cohort browser, we'll have two cohorts in the end. So how do we do that? Uh, in our case, we're selecting diagnosis ICD-10, and there we're selecting for uh, I-20 till I-25 ischemic heart diseases. So this is a part where we're creating cases, case cohort, and then we're using functionality of cohort browser, which is a compare combined cohort, and especially we're using not in the cohort that we already created. So by that, we have two cohorts, cases and controls. And you can see that we have um, 57,000 of cases and 445,000 um, controls. Once we, are, we created our um, cohorts, we can move then to extracting phenotype data for our samples. Um, why do we need this step? Is because the data have to be in a tabular form, because in GVAS and in FIVAS analysis, we'll be using phenotype file where we will have phenotype, meaning whether the sample um, participant has or doesn't have um, ischemic heart disease, and also um, covariates for the uh, two analysis for genome-wide association studies and for phenotype association studies. And I forgot to mention is that here I will pinpoint some part of the code, but the whole code that you can use to run on UKB RAP will be available on a, our GitHub. Here is just so you know how the data flows, what approach are we using, but I will just pinpoint some code. I will not uh, overwhelm you with uh, all of the code that I generated for this um, use case. So, how will we extract um, tabular data? For that, we will be using our new functionality, which is called DX extract underscore data set. We'll download a data dictionary. We'll extract corresponding uh, field names uh, 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 to UK Biobank field IDs, because as you may know from our overview webinar, there is a conversion between um, 
UKB uh, filed ID, field ID and UKB, uh, and UKB RAV field name. So we need to uh, account for that. And then we will extract these field names for cases and controls. So what, uh, what the input um, do we have for this step? We have uh, our two cohorts that we created and also list of uh, field IDs that we want to extract. Then we'll do the whole extraction. It is done by um, create by writing Python code in JupyterLab. And as I said already, the code is available um, in our uh, GitHub repository. And then you end up with a tabular uh, phenotypic uh, data. Okay, so we uh, created uh, this data in a tabular form. Now we need to prepare our array data, because as I already mentioned, is that array data um, was mapped to the um, previous version of reference genome. And in order for our array data to match our impute data, we need to leave them over. So that is basically why do we need this step? We need to have um, both data mapped to the latest reference genome. So we started with array data, and here you can see that this is a field ID, UKB field ID. We also have our uh, new reference genome. Uh, we have UCSC chain file, which actually help us to move from TRCH 37 to 38. We'll be then doing um, running WDL script. And inside the script, there is a Picard liftover with CF, and then we have um, merged lifted array data. So we start with array data in Plink format. We'll then convert them to VCF and run Picard VCF, and then we will convert them back to Plink for the further um, genome-wide association status analysis. Uh, so here you can see the detailed uh, information on input. Um, also, I want to pinpoint that uh, the reference genome is already available on our platform. You don't have to download it and pay for the storage. It's in bulk exome sequences helper files. You will find pasta uh, file for that. And here is a link to UCSC chain file that we used in our example. So as I said, we'll be converting from Plink to WCF, then running Picard and then converting back. And then also we'll be merging our pair um, chromosome files into one file. So we'll end up in three Plink files, the Plink trio uh, for all of the merged results. Here is just um, uh, some information about uh, configuration, the runtime and cost. And I just want to uh, have a huge disclaimer here is that we, are, we were not running any benchmark testing. So this is an approximate uh, number of hours and number and, and the cost that we got for this step. And you will see that because we know that for our community users, the uh, runtime and cost are very important. So that's why we included this information into this webinar. But please um, take it as a experimental. And as is uh, written here, the cost and runtime may vary. So uh, we're on our uh, lift, uh, lift over, and now actually we have all of our data prepared for the QC step. So we'll now start with the QC. We'll do first uh, the sample QC, but the uh, order actually doesn't matter here. So why do we need to do our sample QC? Basically, we want to um, remove any possible sample swaps and genotyping errors. And we also want to minimize our uh, the effect of population substructure. And also, we want to select only non-related samples, because both GVAS and FIVAS require samples to be non-related. That's, that's why we will be selecting our samples by choosing only the samples that were used to calculate principal component analysis. So we start with the tabular phenotypic data. We're doing QC in a custom code in a, a, as a Jupyter notebook. The code is written in Python 
um, you can take it as an inspiration and run your and write your code in R, for example. And then you have a clean tabular phenotypic data. So what is the approach? We test whether sex and genetic sex are the same uh, we, uh, to avoid any sample mismatches. Um, we select participants. The participant has a wide British ancestry to, to minimize effect of uh, population structure. There is no sex chromosome on OPLOID. And um, we're choosing, uh, we're selecting non-related participants by selecting the one who were used for calculation of uh, principal component analysis. So you can see that after filtering, we have 38,000 of uh, cases and, and almost 300,000 of controls. And this notebook ran for about five minutes and uh, cost less than a one, uh, one pound. Here is a recommended instance, and you'll, you'll see this configuration inside the notebook on a GitHub. And um, we'll be using single node uh, JupyterLab. Actually, for all of the uh, Jupyter Lab instances in this yeah, in this um, analysis, uh, in this whole pipeline, you will be using single node. We ended up with a, a sample QC. Now we'll be doing uh, genomic data QC. We'll start with array data, and then we'll do impute data. Uh, just as a, some introduction, I want to say that the criteria are the same. We're just parallelizing it for the input data because we have a per chromosome files, and we are doing it as a one uh, script in Swiss Army Knife for array data because we have our merged data that we're merging in this step when we were lifting them over. So um, why do we need this step? We need this step to decrease noisiness on the data, the same as with any data cleaning, and increase Chivas uh, results accuracy. So um, we'll be doing um, uh, quality control by several uh, criteria. We'll be checking for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium deviation to detect genotyping error. And I just want to mention here that we are using very strict thresholds for these examples, but we encourage users in our community to play with the threshold a little bit and find the accurate um, threshold for, for your uh, project. And we know that uh, our community user, Phil Greer, is actually working on setting and analyzing different threshold for hardy webbing equilibrium. We're also uh, checking that the date and excluding data with high missing rate, both per variant and per sample. And this GVAS analysis will be performed on autosomes only. So we're selecting only variants in autosomes. So we start with our lifted array data. We're doing uh, the quality control using Plink2 in Swiss Army Knife. And we are ended up with a list of variants to keep after QC. And this list of variants will be then inputting into a Regini. Um, so here you can see uh, how many variants we have before filtering and after filtering. And here is the conf configuration that we have. Now we'll do the same thing for the input data, but as I said, we'll be parallelizing it. That's why we're using Plink2 inside our WDL script. And again, we're ending up with a list of variants to keep um, after QC. Here you can see that the runtime was about 10 hours and the cost was about six pounds. And I don't uh, put here the instance type because it was dynamically uh, selected based on the uh, input files size. Here is just showing you some of the more like um, code. Uh, what were the filter criteria? We were using only samples that contain in phenotypic file. So that's why it's keep only located in autosomes. Then we're checking for the um, minor LL frequency and minor LL count, the missing call rate. And as I mentioned already, we were using quite strict threshold for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium exact test p-value. And these criteria were applied both for array data and for impute data. OK, so now we have all of our data cleaned. 
And we can now move to our first analysis, will be genome-wide association study. So we will be checking of association between variants and selected uh, phenotype. We'll be using first correction because we'll have a little bit unbalanced data. And we're using additive test because Virginia authors uh, suggest this test as a first try. If you don't know anything about your association between phenotype and uh, your um, and genome, they suggest that you could uh, start with an additive test, not recessive or dominant. So here are all of the different inputs that we'll be using. We'll be using lifted array data, impute data, also the variants that we are, are remained after the quality control, and the phenotype and covariates table that is already cleaned. Um, Regini produced mar much more results that I'm showing here. These are just results that we'll be using. It's the results table, when there is a, um, one row per variant, including its p-value and a Manhattan plot. So let me just briefly uh, show you um, how um, the Regini analysis work. So it basically consists of two steps. In the first step, you calculate polygenic risk score for background association correction. And for that, you are using um, the genome-wide data, but the smaller subset than in step two. That is why we are using phenotype, array data, and we are creating um, polygenic risk score for each chromosome, basically. Um, and then in the second step, you are doing the, the association itself when you are testing variant phenotype association. So you're using phenotype, you're using a bigger subset of uh, genome, meaning imputed data, or you can use whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing data here. And you are using PRS from first step as a covariate here and you're ending up with a variant effect. And a uh, covariate you're using like that, that you are doing leave one chromosome out. So you are testing variant by variant. And let's say that if variant is on chromosome six, you are using PRS that is not including chromosome six. So this is really brief introduction in how Regini works. So um, here is the input that we already uh, discussed. Uh, maybe I just want to pinpoint that the lifted array data are in uh, Blink format and imputed data are in BGen format. And here is a list of covariate that we were using in GVAS. So uh, once you get the slides and you can click through that, here are the links to the different UKB, um, to the UKB showcase documentation. So as I already mentioned, We'll be using the Regini's two-step analysis. We'll be using uh, array data for the first step and imputed data for the second step. And uh, we ended up with uh, two and a half uh, southern variants, uh, which were marked as significant variants for the GVAS. So analysis took us about seven hours and it cost uh, 14 pounds with this instance. Uh, here are, again, just some um, settings that we were using, that we are using first um, likelihood ratio test and approximation, um, and first uh, correction, which is, um, and we use it for two reasons, for make it a computational speed up, and for unbalanced data. We performed additive test, and we were using a minimal minor allele count threshold. So here is our Manhattan plot, where on the x-axis we have uh, chromosomes and position on a chromosome, and on the y-axis we have a negative uh, logarithm of p-value. So you can see that we have some spikes in chromosome 9, chromosome 6 of the significantly associated variants. And we have some of the chromosome as chromosome 2, when there is like um, evenly spread on the whole chromosome. So in order to select from, for example, spikes like this um, informative variant, 
we'll be doing our next step, which is linkage disequilibrium clumping. So you can also omit this step and go from genome-wide association studies directly to the phenome-wide association studies. But we decided to make this uh, use case really mm, like um, full if you would like to aggregate your data somehow. Um, the alternative to it, as uh, some of you answer, is a polygenic risk score that you can use. You can aggregate your GVAS results, use polygenic risk score, and instead of LD clumping step here, you would have polygenic risk score creation step here, and then use polygenic risk score in FIVAS. So as I said, we want to reduce number of uh, significant uh, GVAS variant. So we want to um, remain in formativity, but reduce number of variants. And that's why we're using um, linkage disequilibrium clumping, because there will be um, in the process, the most significant uh, variant is selected inside some specific window, and it's called index variants. And all of the other variants are tested whether they have, uh, um, whether there is a significant linkage disequilibrium inside the window that you selected. And if there is significant linkage disequilibrium, then they are put inside uh, this uh, clump. So there is one significant, one index variant that is remained, and then there are uh, different variants that are inside that clump. And uh, I forgot to mention that linkage disequilibrium information was pre-computed by uh, Plink from the 1000 Genomes Project on European population. And we saw that this is an appropriate uh, population for our analysis because we're using wide British subset from UK Biobank. So uh, what are the inputs for this step? We have a GVAS a significant result uh, table. We have also genotype data extracted from uh, imputed data, meaning that uh, for um, each of the two and a half uh, southern variant, we're extracting genotypes for our select participants. And then we're checking, um, we're doing uh, LD clumping uh, by running uh, Python and bash code inside the Jupyter notebook. And the result of this step is a table containing index variants, and we'll be using this index variants for our um, uh, subsequent analysis for the phenol-wide association studies. So you can see that uh, before we have two and a half southern variants, and after clumping, we ended up with a 82 variant uh, to test for. So um, you see that the runtime was about uh, 20 minutes and uh, what is uh, was the cost here. So here are some parameters that we were using. Uh, we're using uh, the significant variants only. That's why at the p-value there was no, uh, sorry, there was no threshold for the uh, p-value. Uh, we're mapping uh, Regini results uh, column names to uh, for Plink to understand. So we need to specify what is a SNP um, column name and what is a p-value column name. And we're selecting a window of 250 kilobases and the threshold for 0 0.1, which means that inside the 250 kilobases uh, window, if there are index variant, if there are variants that have R2 larger than 0 0.1, then there will be assigned to the index variant club. And as you remember, index variant is selected by selecting the most significantly associated, associated variant. And the p-value is taken from this table. So our last part that we have here is a, a FIVAS analysis or phenom-wide association study. So why do we need uh, this step? we can validate our genotype phenotype association from uh, the GVAS. We can discover new, n new tar targets. Uh, so for example, we have a association for the ischemic heart disease, but we can also find that that variant is associated with another diseases, disease or multiple diseases. 
and uh, we can it can be used for a pleiotropic study or repurpose therapy. And here I want to pinpoint because I know that some of you are not currently running Chivas, uh, FIVAS, sorry. Uh, what are the main differences? So for genome-wide association study, there is only one phenotype that you are comparing to the multiple variants. And for the phenotype association study, there is one variant that you are compar comparing to the multiple phenotypes. So in our case, phenome will be um, different ICD-10 codes. In your case, it could be completely different. I don't know, for example, eating habits or whatever uh, set of the set of the ph phenotypes that you want to study. So, uh, how are we starting here? So, we have ICD-10 phenotypes in a long format, and then we have uh, genotype data. So, ICD-10 phenotypes in a long format, meaning that we'll have uh, the table where for each phenotype, for each participant, we have one row, meaning that if the person has ischemia and hypertension, that person will have two rows, will be two times in that table. So that's why uh, phenotypes in a long format. And the genotype data, uh, meaning that for each of the 82 variants that we will be testing, we have a table where we have EID of the participant and um, genotype for that particular variant. We'll be using FIVAS R library in Jupyter Lab, we're using Jupyter Notebook with R code. You can also use R Studio um, uh, instead of that. And we're ending up with a FIVAS significant result table and Manhattan plots for FIVAS. And we'll be also doing aggregation because this step is repeated for 82 times because in each iteration, genotype data will be different because we have 82 variants after our linkage disequilibrium clumping step. So, um, covariates that we'll be using here um, are um, um, a little bit less than a, in a GVAS uh, step because we are not using anything connected with the diseases, something like uh, age when a high blood pressure was uh, um, diagnosed. And actually, it will be very interesting uh, if uh, you are using a different covariance, if you already are running FIVAS, if you can write to community, what actually cover, how, what is your like logic for creating, for selecting covariates for the FIVAS analysis? We're really cu curious uh, for the fruitful discussion. Okay, so what is the approach? As I already said, we will be using FIVAS R library, and uh, we will be doing this FIVAS analysis 82 times, and then we'll be aggregate our findings. So we'll be doing preparation um, of the data in uh, Python using uh, Jupyter Notebook, and we'll be running the FIVAS itself in Jupyter Notebook using R kernel. So here are the configuration uh, that we had after running that. So the data preparation step took about 20 minutes and the running FIVAS for the 82 uh, analysis took about uh, six, uh, six hours. We're using single node and here is the instance that we used for that. So you get approximate uh, uh, like uh, for cost and for the runtime. And um, here I would like to show you the Man one of the Manhattan plot that we got for uh, our FIVAS analysis, and I'm using the um, variant that has the most significant p-value after GVAS, and it's a variant in lipoprotein A. And here you can see that there is a threshold uh, based on one ferroni correction. So again, very uh, stringent threshold. And here you, are see, you, you, you can see what are the different uh, significant association. So maybe the font is too small, so I said it's hypertension, either uh, essential or secondary hypertension, and then there's occlusion of cerebral arteries here. So as I said, we run the analysis 82 times, 
And here are the aggregated results for more than two times of occurrence. So uh, with this uh, very uh, strict threshold, not of all of the FIVAS analysis got any significant association. But here you can see that uh, some had. And the most significant association is with essential hypertension and hypertension, hematuria, uh, dementia, colorectal cancer, disorder of fluids, hypovolemia, neoplasm, and cancer of prostate. So this was uh, the aggregation of the FIVAS result. Uh, this was the, our, the whole end-to-end -end analysis. So I would like to conclude it by again stating the thing that I was um, saying in the beginning, that uh, by doing this analysis, we proved that researchers can use UKBRA for the whole pipeline of their end-to-end -end genomic analysis. Uh, we are doing cohort selection in cohort browser, and I already was looking into questions that you were asking. And if you have some more uh, complex phenotype definition, so the question was about if you have uh, um, uh, ICD-10 codes in two different fields, then you can use cohort browser. Uh, if you are using more complex, you can use our uh, uh, Spark um, Jupyter um, lab and query data there. But here we were using cohort selection in cohort browser. We were then using, uh, we were doing sample QC using custom code in JupyterLab. Array lift over were done, was done by parallelizing using WDL script and then using DX compiler. We're doing genetic data QC by either using Swiss Army knife and Plink inside it or doing WDL script and Plink inside it. We are doing GVAS using our Regini app, and we are doing um, linkage is equilibrium clumping by running custom code inside the Jupyter lab. You can also, for this, use Swiss Army knife and Plink inside. And FIVAS was done by using FIVAS R library inside Jupyter lab with R kernel. So you are having Jupyter notebook, but you are um, writing R and running our code inside it. So I just want to mention that um, uh, you, in case you would like to ask something more of uh, us and, uh, or we were not able to answer your questions today, we'll post everything to the DNA Nexus community. You can join, it's for free, and uh, you can see that there is a, a, the very valuable resource for the information about UKB RAP. And I would like to acknowledge our community engagement team that helped me to uh, test the notebooks and test the um, documentation to the code. And documentation will be released soon. So it's Alexander Lee, Andre Kalampir, and uh, Arkar Chai Funktamasan. And I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. And we'll have, uh, uh, so I see that it's 54. So we'll have some time for going through the question and pinpoint the one that seems um, um, interesting or important to me. So let me just look. So before I was, uh, I was already answering about the complex phenotype. Uh, also, there was a question about why are we using Regini instead of Plink for the GVAS? So the thing is that the Plink is very good tool if you don't have uh, the magnitude or the scale of the data that we have. I encourage you to look at the Regini paper where they were doing some benchmark testing and um, see that Regini is much more um, compute effective for such large data. So that is why we're using Regini for these uh, purposes. Um, also, there was a question whether we are using um, Leaf one chromosome out for Regini. Yes, this is exactly what we are using. Uh, now there is a new question if the GVAS step is parallelized. Yes, it is parallelized inside, inside the Regini app. Um, uh, if you want, to, there is a question that if you want to extract genotype data of unrelated individuals, how we can do that on RAP? Well, then you can use exactly the code that we already released on our GitHub because we are using this field used for uh, 
to compute principal component analysis. And we know that UK Biobank team were using only unrelated um, individuals for that. Or you can uh, look into our documentation of um, our colleague Yichi Huang on Alzheimer's disease, GVAS, and there she was using kinship degree. So there's also another field uh, like kinship degree, and there you can select only unrelated um, people there. Um, how do you select a significant association from GVAS? Uh, is it according to the GVAS threshold or you select the variant with the top hits? Actually, for that, we were using a linkage equilibrium clumping. So we selected only significant results. And from that significant results, by using um, a window, uh, which is 250 kilobases and uh, linkage is equilibrium threshold, we were selecting the index variance. So this was our aggregation uh, strategy. But, but as I mentioned, you can also use polygenic risk score. Um, there was also a question whether it's for whole exome sequencing data. Well, um, we were not using whole exome sequencing data. We were using imputed uh, data uh, from Genomics England. These data were released in the late um, 2022. Uh, I think that we'll be um, redoing or um, this uh, tutorial once the uh, once the BGen file will be released for 200k whole genome sequencing data. To see, oh, there is a question. Uh, what if I run my QC using loops written in Bash? How do I submit these jobs? Would JupyterLab work? Well, this is a perfect question because my colleague Andre Klemper just posted uh, last week a query of the week. Andre is doing that every week in the end of the week. And uh, last week he was showing how you can actually run your custom code using three uh, different ways. So I will summarize it briefly here. So you either, either can use Swiss Army Knife, and first you upload your script to the platform, and then you run it inside Swiss Army Knife. Or you can use Cloud Workstation, or you can use TTYD, which is a web-based terminal, which is my favorite, actually. If you don't want to run the analysis repeatedly, uh, I suggest you to, to use that. In case you would like to run your analysis repeatedly, I uh, suggest you to look on our webinar about how to create applets, because by that you can productionalize your code. 